conference. I found it's essential to have a sense of humour when you're a politician, particularly if you speak out on inequality. Especially when I'm talking about gender equality, I now expect that my words will be misrepresented no matter how carefully I choose them. I lose count of the times that my comments are twisted and caricatured by sections of the media. Suggesting that children should play with whatever toys they choose becomes mandatory Barbies for boys. <laughs> Encouraging praise for girls for more than just how they look becomes never telling your daughter that she's beautiful. Standing one day at PMQs while seven months pregnant apparently means I hate women. And my personal favourite, according to the Conservative Woman blog, when I said that pregnancy discrimination is illegal and unacceptable, I was hectoring on my feminist horse. I'd like to know, what exactly is a feminist horse and where can I get one? <laughs> Look, that's the media. It's what they do. And it's what I signed up for in taking on this role. But it's also because there are vested interests that don't want an equal society where as many women as men are in positions of power. They're okay with the fact that three quarters of company directors, three quarters of MPs, and more than three quarters of national newspaper editors are men. The current system works just fine as far as they're concerned. What are these silly women getting all worked up about? Just get back to the kitchen, or if you're the Millibands, perhaps the functional kitchenette. <laughs> make a cup of tea and calm down, dear. But conference, it's hard to be calm when you're angry. And I'm angry that one in four women experience domestic violence during their lives. I'm angry that 40% of teenage girls have been pressured into sex. And I'm angry that women are still paid less than men in 2015. I'm angry, no. I'm absolutely furious that every day, in every city, in every town and village across our country, individual women and girls experience casual sexism and harassment that wears them down, holds them back and wastes potential. And when ordinary girls and women speak out and challenge this, they face a barrage of abuse, both online and offline. Ruth on her birthday night out, turned down a man's sexual advances at a bar and had a pint poured over her. Or the 13-year-old girl who heard more than 10 rape jokes in one school lesson and whose sex education has never covered consent. This young woman was subject to horrible threats of sexual violence just for walking down the street. And yet it's so commonplace that her boyfriend can't even see the problem. Emma Watson, who launched the United Nations He For She campaign with a powerful and passionate speech, said, as soon as I spoke up, I was attacked. Carolyn Criado Perez campaigned for Jane Austen to be featured on her banknotes and received horrendous threats of sexual violence. Jess Ennis-Hill said she didn't want her name associated with a football club that would hire a convicted rapist, and vile people tweeted that they hoped that she would be raped. I wish these were isolated examples. But sadly, the thousands of entries on the Everyday Sexism blog shows that such abuse and misogyny is commonplace. I don't want future generations of women and girls to have to put up with this. This underlying current of sexism and abuse is the environment in which violence against women is endemic. Two women a week are killed by their partners or ex-partners in the UK. One in five teenage girls have suffered physical violence or intimidation from boyfriends. 
and 70% have experienced sexual harassment at school or college. And yet the media will illustrate the story about the murder of a young woman with a photograph of the victim in a bikini. Constance, we have taken action to tackle violence against women, but there is much more to do to eradicate these appalling crimes. In government, Lynn Featherstone secured £40 million to support victims of domestic violence and a further £10 million specifically for women's refuges. We've introduced a new offence of domestic abuse, of coercive and controlling behaviour, because this kind of abuse can do just as much harm as physical violence. We've criminalised forced marriage, introduced new stalking laws, and thanks to dedicated campaigning by Julian Huppert, we've introduced a new law to tackle revenge porn. <coughs> Lynn has championed the cause of girls at risk of fem uh, female genital mutilation at home and abroad. Thanks to her efforts, we've changed the law to better protect girls at risk and improve reporting so that this appalling crime uh, is just not going to be able to continue and the girls who are needing protection, the people that allow them to be cut, can properly be brought to justice. We will not stop their conference. We recognise there is much more to do. We will teach quality sex and relationships education in all schools, including consent, so that young people can get the right information the right way rather than ending up with warped ideas about relationships from looking at internet porn. We'll tackle the absolutely unacceptable harassment of girls and women in schools and colleges by learning from best practice to create safe, respectful environments. And we will protect funding for tackling violence against women and girls and improve refuge and rape crisis centre provision with national sources of funding. Violence against women is about power. And in economic terms, there is also a power imbalance. It's 2015, yet we still have a 19% pay gap between men and women. Men hold 65% of management positions. And when a pregnant MP dares to aspire to cabinet office, she is met by patronising comments about whether she can handle it and accused of being a bad mother. At the time of a cabinet reshuffle, yet again, the media excels itself. Though Nick did at least uh, post an appropriate response on Twitter. <laughs> However, we've certainly made progress. Dedicated work by Vince Cable, Lord Davies and Helena Morrissey has led to a huge increase in women on the boards of our top companies, from 12% in 2011 to 23% today. The pay gap has fallen. But it still means that basic, women basically work for free for 57 days a year. Our Think Act report initiative has seen 270 large companies covering 2.5 million employees share best practice and take positive action to improve gender equality at work. But it has delivered far too little pay transparency. And that's why I was so determined to fight within government for the long-standing Lib Dem policy of making large employers publish their pay gap between men and women. It wasn't an easy battle to win. From the beginning, Labour only wanted a voluntary approach, and the Tories didn't want it at all. But at meeting after meeting, and sometimes I get invited to Cabinet now, I plugged away at the issue. Nick was incredibly supportive, and when I said to him there might be an opportunity to use the Small Business Bill to deliver pay transparency, he was up for the fight with the Tories. So finally, conference. This week, we amended the bill in the House of Lords so that within a year, large companies will have to set out their average pay for men and women. Now, <laughs> that might make uncomfortable reading for some companies. Good. That is exactly the intention, to shine a light on the pay gap so that employers take steps to address the causes. This will unlock the information for companies and employees to ask the tough questions about why men are still paid more than women. It's something that I and you can be proud of achieving in government. It's a victory for Nick Clegg, it's a victory for the Liberal Democrats, but most importantly, it is victory for women.
The pay gap is not just about discrimination and unconscious bias, though those certainly can play a role. We have far too few women in well-paid sectors like science, engineering and technology. And incidentally, far too few men teaching in primary schools or working in the care sector. Breaking down gender stereotypes is a vitally important part of this problem, though not everyone agrees. We've created new careers guidance for parents to encourage girls to open their horizons. Miriam Gonzalez Durantes and her pioneering Inspiring Women campaign is getting role models from all sectors into schools to encourage girls to aspire. This week, I joined Lib Dem Belinda Brooks Gordon at Birkbeck College to hear about the steps they're taking to get more women into science. Government funding is incentivising universities across the country to follow their lead. Another major cause of inequality in the workplace is inequality at home. The early waves of feminism rightly fought for women to be taken seriously at work. That revolution happened, but it wasn't accompanied by a similar step change in men's role at home. It should be just as unremarkable for a man to be turning up with baby to the rhyme time class as it is for a woman to be off to a business meeting. <laughs> Women still take on the vast majority of caring responsibilities for young children and for elderly relatives. Every family is different and needs to be able to make their own choices about how to share the care. But until now, the law has entrenched the outdated assumption that mum should stay at home and dad should go out to work. Not any more, thanks to Liberal Democrats in government introducing shared parental leave. <laughs> it's a radical change, but a simple one. It gives parents more choice, benefits children, and also encourages more equality at work. Simply put, it's my proudest achievement in government. Of course, getting dads to use it can be a cultural challenge. It's new, so we need to raise awareness. And it's already prompting some very interesting discussions. Some dads-to-be have said that they'd like to take shared parental leave but they're worried about the impact on their career. <laughs> Welcome to the world of the working mum. <laughs> the truth is, our economy needs the skills of parents in the workplace, and neither mums nor dads should have their careers stalled just for being parents. Perhaps with men engaged in these dilemmas as much as women, we can change attitudes and ditch the parenting penalty at work. We do know from other countries that use it or lose it leave is a key factor in driving take up from men. So Liberal Democrats will increase paternity leave from two to six weeks, extra leave that only the father can take. And once parental leave is over, the cost of childcare is a huge problem for working couples. I'm proud that we've extended free early years education for three and four year olds and extended it to hundreds of thousands of two-year-olds as well. Incidentally, I'm pretty frustrated that my own constituents have been left behind because the SNP government in Scotland refused to prioritise early years education. Only after years of campaigning by Willie Rennie did the SNP eventually extend free provision to some two-year-olds, but they've gone nowhere near as far as what Liberal Democrats in government have delivered. More free childcare has been a great help for many families, but we need to go further. All two-year-olds should benefit. And we are the only party committed to closing the gap in support for working parents by extending free childcare from the end of paid parental leave until two years old. This can make a huge difference to a parent's career. If you can't afford to go back to work until free childcare support kicks in when your child is two, and if you have more than one child, it can easily mean many years out of the workplace, losing contacts and confidence. And confidence can be absolutely key. As a minister in the business department, I meet a lot of senior businesswomen. In our discussions about how to get more women into senior roles, I'm often struck by the way the conversation will turn to what happens in schools and how to equip girls with the confidence to aim high and achieve their aspirations. 
They tell me that the lack of positive role models in the media and an endless focus on what women look like can hold many girls back. And these concerns are absolutely echoed by girls themselves. Girl Guiding do excellent work to make girls' voices heard. They found that 87% of girls think that women are judged more on looks than ability. And 75% think that sexism affects most areas of their lives. Yesterday, I visited a sixth form college with John Pugh and spoke to a fabulous group of young people, mainly girls. Yet the first person to put their hand up to ask a question was one of the boys. And nine times out of ten, this is my experience when I speak to school groups. From a very early age, girls are socialised not to put themselves forward, not to put their head above the parapet, not to have that confidence. So is it any wonder that 20 years later, when it comes to negotiating a pay rise or putting themselves forward for promotion, the women might be less likely to do so? In fact, there's a whole stream of adjectives used to criticise women who get too big for their boots. Bossy, brazen, pushy, shrill, strident. When was the last time you heard a man being called strident? <laughs> we have a wider culture that values women primarily for how they look, while promoting an ideal look, which is at best time-consuming and at worst impossible to achieve. I've heard 14-year-old girls say that they aren't comfortable going to school unless they've spent an hour doing their makeup. Think what that hour a day could achieve for a schoolgirl in terms of learning, exercise, sleep, or building friendships. This all combines to have a silencing effect on girls and young women. But we need those voices to be heard. So I constantly try and convince women to get engaged and stand for election themselves. Because, frankly, conference, seven women out of 56 MPs is just not good enough. We need to do more to nurture talented women in the Lib Dems, as well as getting more women involved in politics more generally. But images like these certainly don't help. I've argued within government for a review to be led by senior representatives of the media to look at the implications of media sexism. Guess what? The Tories blocked it. They're either happy with how things are or too afraid of a backlash. As we might find out in tomorrow's papers, sometimes suggestions like this one can be taken out of context. But make no mistake, this is not a call for censorship. This is not a call for editorial agendas to bow down to government diktat. This is a call for an independent review chaired by media representatives to work with government and other stakeholders to take the issue of media sexism seriously. We know from the Bailey Review into sexualisation of childhood that sound recommendations from a respected independent reviewer can lead to real change across industry and government. The United Nations last week published a report saying gender equality is still 80 years away. We can't afford to wait that long. Conference, I'm not going to pretend this is an easy fight, but you know, and I know, that we are up for this fight. Liberal Democrats in government have won hard-fought battles to improve the lives of women and girls in the UK. Shared parental leave, more women on boards, pay transparency, new rate crisis centres, extending flexible working, more free childcare, support for carers, action on FGM, fairer pensions, tax cuts for low earners. We should be talking about this record with pride on the doorstep as we campaign in the weeks ahead. And our efforts in government would not have been possible without your efforts in our constituencies. Our victories in government are your victories. And yes, the fights we have not won have also been the crosses that you have had to bear. And we have more to do. 
sex and relationships education in all schools, use it or lose it paternity leave, a further £400 tax cut, a million more women in work, pensions fairness enshrined in law, tackling media sexism, closing the childcare gap, national funding for victims of violence. To do this, we need more Liberal Democrat MPs and especially more Lib Dem women MPs. And I am optimistic, Conference. I believe that we have the energy and the passion for the things that we believe in to go out there and to win. To go out there and win new Lib Dem women MPs. Win Mid Dorset and Northpool, Vicky Slade MP. Win Berwick, Julie Perkson MP. Win Watford, Dorothy Thornhill MP. Win Taunton, Rachel Gilmore MP. Win Oxford West and Abingdon, Leila Moran MP. Win Gordon, Christine Jardine MP. Win Hazel Grove, Lisa Smart MP. We will confound the cynics and return to Westminster to fight to turn our manifesto ideas into reality again. We will keep fighting to create a fairer society where everyone can speak up and be heard. We will keep fighting to build a stronger economy where every woman and man can make their contribution. We will keep fighting for fairness, for feminism, for opportunity for all. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you to John Ball for working tirelessly as my aide for the last 20 minutes. Uh, we'll be back in the hall from 2.15. Enjoy your lunch, everyone.